I want to talk in this lecture about the history and development of the tabernacle from Mount Sinai to Mount Moriah. And then in the last lecture, we'll consider information about the temple itself, <laughs> which means we probably won't get to Ezekiel's temple except maybe in a few rough comments, but that's the way it goes. Some of this is somewhat new to me, and maybe some of you have reflected on this before, but because it's not something that I've ever heard discussed very much, I think it's useful to share it with you. So we'll begin with, under A, number one, the tabernacle as portable Sinai. I think this is a valuable way to understand the tabernacle, probably the central and most important way. Remember that when we get to Mount Sinai, you have this configuration that's described in Exodus 19 where they are to put bounds around this mountain, it says. Let's see if we can get the exact verse here. Exodus 19, verse 12, You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Since these are Hebrews, they probably used Uzis to shoot through. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. Verse 21, Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, Go down, warn the people, lest they break through to Yahweh to gaze, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to Yahweh consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. So that Moses is told to put some type of boundary at the mountain lest people touch the mountain. Well, where does the mountain start? I don't think that Mount Sinai, you've got a flat plain and all of a sudden, boing, up comes this mountain. The mountains kind of gradually rise out of the ground. And they don't boing out. This is an unboingy mountain. So you've got an arbitrary line that Moses establishes here. And nobody's allowed to cross that line. Now, you see how that's like the tabernacle. Uh, later on, they build an altar here, and Moses stands between the people. They build 12 pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and Moses stands between them and puts blood on the altar and blood on the people, which binds them together. It binds Israel to this form of worship. Now, there will no longer be many altars. There's going to be one altar. And those who minister at this one altar are told in Exodus 20 that they're never to go up by steps on the altar lest their nakedness be exposed upon it. You remember that? This one altar, Exodus 20, verse 26, you shall not go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness may not be exposed upon it. So it doesn't matter if you have clothes on. And you could have underwear and pants and everything else. If you go up by the steps to the altar, then in a religious ceremonial sense, your nakedness is exposed. And that calls forth the anger of God. And so they're not allowed to have an altar that's high. Now, you can think about this. Peter may discuss this. You get to the temple and you've got this high altar with steps going up. So what's the difference? Well, what happens within the next six months is God specifies these priestly garments which are anointed and they do cover the nakedness. They don't cover it because they're clothes. They cover it because they're anointed. And therefore, after six months from now, you can have an altar that you go up by steps on if you're a priest and you have the holy underwear that's been anointed. And that's where Mormons get this holy underwear stuff. You see, that's Old Testament worship. It's a... <laughs> But this is true. But at this point, there are these different rules. And the ceremony in chapter 24 of putting blood on the altar and the same blood on the people means that they are linked to this form of worship and they accept that no longer will there be many altars. Or there will be one altar, which is better than the previous altars. It's superior to them. Now there's this boundary behind this altar that no one's allowed to cross through. In Exodus 24, we have the elders, along with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, go halfway up the mountain, and they have this meal with God where they eat the peace offering. At the same time, Moses sacrifices a burnt offering and links the people to the altar with the blood. They also sacrifice peace offering, which, of course, is shared, and they eat. And they go halfway up this mountain and eat it, and as they look up, 
they see the blue firmament and God enthroned above it. And then Moses goes up here. So now, it's real obvious what this is, isn't it? This is the Holy of Holies where Moses goes. And what happens while Moses is up there? Well, he gets the directions for the tabernacle for one thing, which shows you that the tabernacle is going to be some type of replica of this environment. Number two, God carves out the Ten Commandments and gives them the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments while He's up here. And the Ten Commandments are put inside the Ark of the Covenant, which is in the most holy place. And so then it becomes very obvious that the cloud that Moses goes into is the Holy of Holies. It's equivalent to it. Halfway up here where there's this table of food and where the priests eat food is equivalent to the holy place with the table of showbread on it. And this boundary, this lapis lazuli boundary in Exodus 24 that the elders see and they see God beyond it, that's equivalent to the veil, the cherubim veil. And this boundary at the foot of the mountain is equivalent to the blue veil that separates the people from the holy place. They can't go in there. The altar that's on the other side here, that's put out in the courtyard. And now we're ready to go. And this cloud, which is the pillar of cloud and fire, moves and takes up residence in Exodus chapter 40, takes up residence in this holy place and also forms a column above the tabernacle. Now, we leave Mount Sinai, but who cares? Because this is Mount Sinai. If you're going to meet with God, you've got to go up on the mountain and have a holy mountain. Now, the tabernacle is the holy mountain. It's a portable holy mountain. And so wherever God's cloud goes, the holy mountain goes with Him. So they march across the wilderness to some other place, and they set the tabernacle up, and that's Sinai. They have Sinai with them all the time in the form of the tabernacle. Now, that should tell you something about sacred space. There's nothing taboo or sacred about Mount Sinai. Once the tabernacle's built, anybody can go up there. This now they can't go in here. Wherever God is, that's sacred space. A couple of other things to note. When Moses is in the most holy place here, he doesn't eat anything for 40 days. As I recall, he doesn't drink anything for 40 days either, and that would mean that he is miraculously sustained. But one thing's for true, he's fasting. Now you see, when the New Covenant comes, we eat bread and drink wine up in here with God in the Holy of Holies. That's a total change. But this fasting principle being excluded from food is seen in the fact that Moses fasted the whole time he was in the Holy of Holies. So now what we have is Mount Sinai on the march. And wherever Mount Sinai goes, that's where the people go. The pillar of cloud and fire moves, and they take the tabernacle down, and they make it all into little itty-bitty portable clouds. Remember, each one of those pieces of furniture is carried on the shoulders, and it has a dolphin skin over it, which is a watery boundary. So they've got these little clouds of God's house moving through the wilderness, and they get to a place, and they set up the camp again, and there's Mount Sinai again. So Sinai is moving, and it's moving toward Zion. The destiny is to get to Jerusalem. Did you have a question now? I, I, I did. I just that boundary thing, and maybe it's a technical thing, but isn't that boundary, isn't that altar there, you said it's outside the courtyard, is that it's inside of the tabernacle there? Is, it, is the relationship of the boundary of Sinai and the altar? Yeah. You've got it shown out. Oh, oh okay. Okay. I just did. I think the boundary no one was allowed to cross, the altar is on the other side of that. And similarly, in the tabernacle, the altar is on the outside of this boundary. Now, just one thing about sacred space. Often in the New Testament, the personage of, of the believer is sacred space. And uh, can that also be extended to magistrates and officers and historically laws against the assault on the person of, a, of an officer of the church or of a civil magistrate is a more aggravated offense? Is that an extension of the principle of sacred space? I don't know that it's related to sacred space so much as it is to respect for God's anointing and the fact that they're representatives of God. I mean, you could relate it, I suppose. Everything ultimately relates, but I wouldn't make a direct link that way. But 
I'm not saying it's wrong either. It's easier for me to think of it in terms of anointing. Uh huh. Is there an equivalent to labor? Yeah, in that they were supposed to wash themselves and keep themselves from women and do all this stuff, which meant that they were not to become unclean. So there's at least something there. And in a larger way, crossing through the Red Sea, the Psalms, I think, forget which Psalm it is, indicates that it rained on them from heaven while they went through dry shod through the Red Sea. So there's baptismal imagery there, and in that washing brings them and enables them to go to the altar. You always pass through water. So, now Mount Sinai can go on the march and the people can go with it. And its destiny is Jerusalem. Now, how did they know that Jerusalem was the place to go? How did they know it was the city of the great king? And the answer to that, I believe, is in Genesis 14 where Abraham pays tithes to Melchizedek king of Salem. That's obviously the same place. Melchizedek is the great king, and Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Then at that point, Abraham is shown by God that there's something about the city of Jerusalem, the city of Zion. That's where they want to be. That is marked out at that early point in Genesis 14 as the capital of a land. And remember, Genesis 14 has to do with the war of the five kings against the four kings over who will control the land. And Genesis 14 reveals that it's Abraham who controls the land. Because after Chedor Laomer defeats Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham defeats Chedor Laomer. And then, of course, Abraham is worried that Chedor Laomer is going to come back and get him. And God says in chapter 15, don't be afraid, I'm your shield. But that's what's happening in chapter 14. Abraham and his fighting men go out and defeat Chedor Laomer. So it's revealed that Abraham has true rule over the land, but Melchizedek is actually the king, and he's king of this place called Salem. That would indicate to them that the center of the kingly activity is Jerusalem, and that's where you want eventually to get to. Secondly, in Genesis chapter 22, Abraham takes Isaac to Mount Zion, or actually Mount Moriah, which is right next to Mount Zion, and sacrifices him there, or almost does. And that sets up what all the sacrifices mean. Every Jew knew that the animal sacrifices represented human sacrifice because God substituted the ram for Isaac. In addition, as we saw last year, we talked about it some, the Bible talks about the sacrifices as sons, the son of the herd. So every time you offer an animal, you're offering your son. So they knew that it connected with Isaac, and that also would communicate them that the religious center of the land ultimately is going to be the Zion Moriah complex. I think it's Chronicles, I can't remember the verse exactly, maybe I'll find it before tomorrow, that says that Solomon built the temple on Mount Moriah. And that's, of course, yeah, okay, 3-1. That's where uh, Abraham took Isaac. So, this is clear from the patriarch. It's clear from Abraham, so they know when they get to the land in Judges chapter 1 that Jerusalem is the place they want to take. And they do, initially, and we see something about Jerusalem in Judges chapter 1 starting in the very first verse of Judges you see this move to Jerusalem immediately it came about after the death of Joshua that the sons of Israel inquired of the Lord saying who shall go first against the Canaanites to fight against them the land has been definitively conquered but now we start the mopping up operation and now we start to really settle things the last verse of Joshua says that the high priest died the death of the high priest means everybody can go into his inheritance. And so the very last verse of Joshua 24 indicates that everybody who might be in a city of refuge gets to go home. I mean, your settlement of the land is absolutely perfect in the last verse of Joshua. Everybody can go where they're supposed to go. But then there's kind of a second stage of conquest after Joshua's death. And they say, who is going to lead in this? And the Lord says, Judah will go up, verse 2. That's the royal tribe. That's been established ever since Genesis. Judah will take the leadership. Judah gets Simeon to help them out, verse 4. Judah went up, and the Lord gave Canaanites and Perizzites into their hands, and they defeated 10,000 men at Bezek. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek. Adonai Bezek means the Lord of Bezek or the Lord of Lightning. This is Thor. This is Jupiter. This is Jove the god of lightning and they find him and they fight against him they defeat them verse 6 Adonai Bezek 
fled and they pursued him and caught him and chopped off his thumbs and big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their, and notice that's world, the whole world here symbolically, the 70 nations, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off, used to gather up under my table. So he has a table that the dogs eat the crumbs from. I mean, this man is pictured as ruling the world and being in charge of all the food. Now, in the law, God is revealed as the food king. The feasts of Israel are called, Passover is called my feast, Pentecost is called a feast of harvest, and Tabernacles is called a feast of ingathering. God is the food giver. And the manna and the quail and the water and everything else establishes God as a food giver. But all the Canaanite gods were food givers, and that's going to be the problem. Are you going to get involved with these fertility food-giving gods, or are you going to worship the true food giver? the true husband who regulates the food in the garden and tells you which tree to eat and which tree not to. Well, Adonai Bezek is pictured as being in charge of food and also ruling the world symbolically, but he admits that what's done to him is just. He says, as I have done so, God has repaid me. Now it says, they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. Now why bother with that? Why not just kill him there in Bezek? But they go through this ritual, basically, of eye for eye, tooth for tooth, cutting off his thumbs and toes, which Adonai Bezek admits is just, even though most of the Christian commentators act horrified at it. And then they go to all the trouble to take him to Jerusalem, which they had at least at that time conquered, where he dies. So it's as if they bring him before Yahweh, the great king, in Jerusalem, and present him there as a trophy of the conquest. And again, they seem to understand the centrality of Jerusalem here. It's important. And the question you know that you would raise is, how did David know that Jerusalem was supposed to be so important? How did these guys know? Well, it goes back to Abraham. Later on in this chapter, we find out in verse 21, the sons of Benjamin, who were given the management of Jerusalem by Joshua, they didn't drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. The Jebusites have lived with the sons of Benjamin in Jerusalem up to this day, up to the time Samuel wrote this. Later on, the Jebusites wind up taking the city back pretty much altogether for obvious reasons. The tribe of Benjamin is completely wiped out except for 600 men at the end of this book. So if the Benjaminites were supposed to run Jerusalem and they're almost totally wiped out, then it's going to be pretty easy for the Jebusites to take the city back. So they take it back and David has to conquer it. But it's obvious that the destination of the ark and of the cloud is to get to Jerusalem. We want to get from Sinai to Jerusalem, and that's where this motion is going to climax. And between that, the ark resides at Shechem sometimes, and it... Shiloh at other times, and at Bethel apparently, in different places. But Jerusalem is where we're going to go. And that's apparent from the history up to this point. It's marked out. Did you have a comment? Yeah, I, I know this is often a key fact, but just to say one thing about the significance of cutting off thumbs and big toes. It's a good thing to disable It disables them for war, but they're also... Peter's going to talk about this. In fact, Peter will answer your question. And he discusses... <laughs> the blood on the thumbs, big toes, and earlobe, and circumcision. So this relates to it. This is sort of when Paul says, I wish these Judaizers would go ahead and cut themselves all the way off. This is the same thing. <laughs> okay. So it has religious meaning. And I'm glad you raised the point because it's not just eye for eye, disable these guys so they can't shoot arrows and can't run. It's also... This man made himself a false priest, a false food god, and so instead of having an anointed thumb with blood, his thumb is cut off, and it relates. Okay, three then. We're in between. We get to the book of Samuel, and Samuel has, basically as his theme, it has the theme of kingship. Who is king? Because at the end of Judges, we've read several times that there was no king in Israel, and everybody did what was right in his own eyes. And the traditional... Christian commentators rightly understood that that meant that Yahweh's kingship was not being made manifest in the land because the sins in the last two stories in Judges are sins of Levites. The Levites, the pastors of the churches, local churches, because Levites were scattered in Israel to be pastors of local synagogues in all the towns. That's clear in Deuteronomy and also in Joshua and Judges. They're falling down on the job. They're not making the kingship of Yahweh manifest to the people. And as a result... 
everything else is falling apart and there's anarchy. When the church doesn't do her job, then there's anarchy in the land. That's the message. And so Samuel says, in order for there to be order in the land, the ark must be recognized as king. In other words, Yahweh is king and everybody else is subordinate. Now, the modern evangelical commentaries follow the liberals in saying that the reason there was anarchy in Israel is because there wasn't a strong central political system. When it says there was no king in Israel and everybody did what was right in his own eyes, what that meant was the people needed a strong central government. But that's not what it meant. And the book of Samuel is in some ways a polemic against that because Samuel in 1 Samuel 8 says that's not what you need. You don't need a strong central king like all the nations. What you need is the Lord. The Lord is supposed to be your king. And then that dynamic works itself out in Samuel. When Saul is anointed king, this is sufficiently important to where we should glance at it for a second. When Saul is called in 1 Samuel chapter 9, the story tells us that he was the son of Kish and that some donkeys were lost, some she-asses. Maybe the fact that they're feminine has something to do with searching for a bride. I don't know. But the donkeys of Kish were lost, and Kish sends Saul out to find them. Well, what Saul finds is not the she-asses, but he finds Samuel. And Samuel anoints him, and Samuel sets him at the head of the table and gives him a sacrificial portion of food which treats him like kind of a subordinate priest. At this time, as we'll see, the tabernacle is torn down. The sacrifices that are being offered are less holy than the tabernacle sacrifices were. In the tabernacle sacrifices, only the priest could eat some of these portions. It seemed, well, that's not true. In the peace offering, the layman would eat them, and that's what's offered here. And the choicest food, which would have gone to Samuel, Samuel gives to Saul. And Saul goes into the city where Samuel is, and he goes through a succession of gates as he goes up to the high place. And he gets to the high place, and he spends the night on the rooftop in an upper room. And then the next day, he talks about how he comes down out of the city and works his way down. It's just definite going up, coming down imagery in this story. Well, along the way, as he goes home, the Holy Spirit falls upon him, and he starts to prophesy. And then the question is asked in 1 Samuel 10, verse 11. It came about when all who knew him previously saw that he prophesied now with the prophets, the people said to one another, What's happened to the son of Kish? Notice that, the son of Kish. Is Saul also among the prophets? And a man there answered and said, Now who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? Well, who is the father of the prophets? And who is now Saul's father? Samuel. Samuel is the father of the prophets, and Samuel has become Saul's father by anointing. And that's why this is written the way it is. What's happened to the son of Kish? Well, he's not the son of Kish anymore. He's Samuel's son. And when Saul finally gets home, he reports to his uncle all about what happened to the donkeys. <laughs> the question is, is this uncle Kish? Is Kish now being called an uncle instead of a father? Or is it just in the providence of God he met up with one of his uncles and reported to him? The theology is the same. Saul has been adopted by Samuel, and the prophets are the fathers of the kings. Thus, when Elisha dies, what does the king say? My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. The kings are to recognize that God is the true king and that the prophet is his ambassador. And the prophets are to be fathers to the kings, and that is the rule of the kingdom. As long as the king recognized the prophet as his father, the kingship will endure. When the king refuses to hear the prophet, the kingdom will fall apart. Saul refuses to hear the prophet. David commits the same kind of sin Saul does, but he hears Nathan and repents as though his kingdom is assured. What does Samuel have to do with then? Or why is it called kingdoms? Isn't that right? Isn't it called kingdoms in the Septuagint? Well, it's because that's what it has to do with. Two kingdoms. Really, the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God. Now, when you look at Samuel, then you see where is the true king pictured, and it's the ark. And the book of Samuel starts off with the ark in a temple. The tabernacle is called a temple in 1 Samuel. A palace. Hey, call means palace or temple. And Samuel ends with this plague and the uh, remission of the plague where the site is selected for the new temple. And in between, there is no temple. The tabernacle gets torn down first thing in Samuel, 
and at the end we finally selected a site for rebuilding it. That's the motion of the book. In between, however, there is a temple building incident. In 2 Samuel 6.15, which we'll look at in more detail, David brings up the Ark of the Lord and puts it in a tent in Jerusalem. But they don't rebuild the tabernacle. The tabernacle continues to be somewhere else, and the Ark is given a separate tent in Jerusalem. So you have two tabernacles. Now the tabernacle itself is considered to be two tents joined together. The holy place is one tent and the most holy is another tent. And that's why the book of Hebrews talks about the first and second tabernacles, the inner and outer tabernacle is two tabernacles. In David's day, there were actually two separate places. The holy place was at one place. It was at Beth Shemesh. No, it was... Where was it? You know, we'll get to it. But the ark has its own tent in Jerusalem. Solomon comes and puts them back together again later on. But we're in this in-between phase. Well, what happens to the ark? What happens to the tabernacle here? In the early chapters of Samuel describe it. The priests commit what is later in the Bible called the abomination of desolation. They commit abominable acts before the face of God that causes him to desolate the sanctuary. The big passage on the abomination of desolation is Ezekiel 8 through 11, which Peter referred to the other day, where you see all these abominations take place, and actually a very technical word is used, desecrations, something that Gentiles can't do, only priestly people can do. They desecrate the temple, and then God packs up and moves out and then brings the army in to trash it. Now, this almost happened at Mount Sinai, and it happens here. And these abominations consist of seizing the sacrifice and also violating the women who serve at the tabernacle. And there's much symbolism there, but one thing is for sure, there is no moral or cultic boundary being maintained. And God is disgusted, and God packs up and leaves. And when he leaves, he kills everybody and allows the place to be torn down. The ark is taken in battle in 1 Samuel chapter 4. The two sons of Eli the priest are killed on that occasion. Eli falls over dead when he hears that the ark of God was captured, which he doesn't die when he hears his sons have been killed. But Eli was, in spite of his sins, a good man. And when he heard that the ark of God had been captured, he died. But what you also see there is the death of the high priest. And a big inversion that takes place here because the death of the high priest is supposed to release everybody from a city of refuge so they go into the land. <laughs> well, when this high priest dies, the land comes into captivity. Everybody goes into captivity and bondage under the Philistines. And then, of course, his grandson is born who's named Ichabod, and the glory has departed, and that's exactly what happened. The glory left when the ark left because the ark throne is where God is enthroned. Well, the Philistines take the ark into their territory, and they take it into the temple in front of Dagon, and God defeats Dagon. And then God sends plagues on the people, just like the Egyptian plagues. And then they send the ark of God out of Philistine territory, along with five golden rats and five golden emeralds or buboes, if this is some type of bubonic plague. No one knows for sure because diseases like this, they undergo changes in history and take on new forms and trying to figure out exactly what kind of disease this might have been in the ancient world, we don't know. But they had some type of swelling somewhere and they made hunks of gold to represent them and five mice or golden mice or rats. And they put them with the ark and they put the ark on a cart and they had the cart drawn by oxen, female oxen, cows that had, let me see, milk cows, cows that had just calved, who would not want to leave. And so the Philistines set this up so that it would be a miraculous event. We can start in 1 Samuel 6.10. This is important. It doesn't work when David tries to do this. The men did so. They took two milk cows, milch cows, and hitched them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they put the ark of Yahweh on the cart and the box with the golden mice and the likenesses of their hemorrhoids. This is the translation's assumption here. And the cows took the straight way in the direction of Beth Shemesh, which means the house of the sun. They went along the highway, lowing as they went. Now, 
when cattle load, that doesn't mean they coo or purr like cats. That's what I always thought, that the lowing of cattle was kind of like purring of cats. But it means they're bawling. They make this tremendous sound because they don't want to leave their calves, but God is driving this cart and forcing them to go. Do something completely unnatural that they, in the sense, the cattle resist being forced to do this. And you see the miraculous side of this as the ark is driven by God to Beth Shemesh. And they take it there. And then, of course, the ark is delivered. Well, this is a new exodus. I mean, all the exodus motifs are here. God goes into captivity instead of the people. He defeats the Philistine gods. He comes out with spoils. He plagues them. And then he comes back, and it says that they took the ark, and they put it up. Let's see. Verse 15. The Levites took down the ark of Yahweh and the box that was with it, in which were the articles of gold, and put them on a large stone. They offered burnt offerings and sacrifices. A sacrifice here means peace offering. They sacrifice burnt offerings or ascension offerings and peace offerings to Yahweh. And then they made the mistake of peeking into it, and a bunch of them were killed. And so in chapter 7, they sent the ark down to Kiriath Jerim. And the men of Kiriath Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill. So it was on a high place and consecrated Eleazar his son to guard the ark of the Lord. And it came about from the day that the ark remained at Kiriath Jerim that the time was long. It was actually about a hundred years. And then the New American Standard Bible is badly punctuated here. That's the end of the sentence. And the second sentence in the verse says, For it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel remained after the Lord. It was twenty years until the Mizpah incident that follows in the text. But the ark was there at Kirith Jerim for about a century. Well, when you have a new exodus, then by implication you need a new temple. And I think that that's the explanation as to why they didn't take the ark back to the tabernacle and just set everything back up. See, that's the $64 question in the text here is how come Samuel didn't tell him, okay, the ark's back, let's just take the ark back to the tabernacle and get everything set back up again and go with it. Well, two reasons as I see. One, the tabernacle had been defiled through the abomination that causes desolation. And when that happens, you don't rebuild it. When the abomination that causes desolation took place in the days of the temple, they didn't rebuild the temple. It was all torn down by Nebuchadnezzar. They put a new one up. When the abomination that causes desolation took place in the New Testament, in Jesus' day, and Jesus walks out and leaves the temple, and says, this is going to be torn down. They don't rebuild it. The church becomes the temple. And so it seems as if when the temple is defiled, you don't put it back together again. Instead, you make a new one. Secondly, the fact that we have an exodus, a new exodus out of Egypt. And remember, the Philistines were Egyptians, according to Genesis 10. This new exodus out of Egypt requires the building of a new temple. And now at this point, the ark is, so to speak, in the wilderness. And the wilderness wandering here is going to be about 100 years. The ark is at Kirith Jerim, separate, and it's not going to be till David's day, well into the future, that it comes to Jerusalem. And then it's going to be another 30 years or so before, or 40, let's see, it's the 20th year of Solomon's reign that the ark went into the temple. So it could be 40 or 50 years in Jerusalem without being in the temple, just being in a tent. We have a long span of time where the ark is in a separate tent in Jerusalem, but not in the temple. Did anybody have a question? <clears throat> Look, I have missed your comment on this. Uh, chapter 7, verse 2, uh, just 20 years, is that, that's not textually amazing. No, it's just a matter of punctuation. The 20 years is the time that the house of Israel lamented after the Lord and actually begins the next story. Then Samuel spoke to the house of the Lord saying, if you really return with all your heart, then they go to Mizpah and have kind of a covenant renewal. So that's 20 years. You said there's a hundred year period. Yeah, in terms of chronology, you, we've got the end of Samuel's reign. We've got 40 years of Saul's reign. We've got seven years of David out uh, as partial king. And then David brings the ark up to Jerusalem. And then you've got probably 50 years before Solomon's temple is completed and the ark moves in there. Yeah. The ark was not defiled, or was it, or was the tabernacle defiled, or both? The sins of the people defile these houses, and there has to be an atonement. The atonement blood has to be put on the object. 
it's a good question as to what is happening. On the Day of Atonement, help me with this, Peter, if I get it wrong, as we did this last year, it's so hard to remember all these details, but in the system, in Leviticus, what you have is the sins that are committed during the year gradually roll up through the sacrificial system until they're all on the high priest. And on the Day of Atonement, he puts them on the scapegoat, and the scapegoat goes out, and also another animal is shed, and its blood purifies everything. Well, here, Eli dies and the ark goes out. And it would seem to me that there's probably some connection there. The ark is taking the scapegoat position here by going out. And so the suffering of the ark in Philistia then would be the atonement for the sins of the people. It bears their sins. Instead of them going into captivity, the ark goes in. And you see the Philistines... Well, those Philistines, they were fairly cultured people. Being ruled by Philistines was not the worst possible thing. And that's why the Jews continued to kind of be attracted to Philistine rule. They didn't mind it. Samson had to come and stimulate them to be uncomfortable. But what the Lord does here is He puts a lot of fear into the Philistines because they become afraid of Yahweh, which means they're going to treat the Israelites better. So what the ark does is protect the people by its action. If the tabernacle has been defiled, let's say, because the ark is no longer in it and the sins of Eli's sons, I mean, throughout the next hundred years, they continue to do sacrifices there and continue to have sacrifices at the tabernacle without the ark in it. Right. Well, how or why could they do that? It seems like he They can lost. only do ascension offerings and peace offerings and cereal offerings which are attendant upon them. So the purification and reparation offerings have to do with sanctifying the holy space, and, and that's not an operation. And because it's peace offerings, before the tabernacle was set up, that could be done in many places. Then during this interregnum, you could have many high places, and the sacrifices were done in many high places. So sacrifices at the altar outside were being done, but not inside the house? Yeah. I'm sure there was no blood taken in and put on the horns of the golden altar because that would have been a purification offering and for that to even be relevant you have to have the system in operation and the system isn't in operation and see the ark the same, they, we'll see that they worship in front of the ark, like David sets an altar up in front of the ark and they do sacrifices there but they're not purification offerings, they're not sin offerings uh-huh. so the tabernacle is, is still standing it's not wiped out and Eli's son died he dies, it's not just completely dismantled Yeah, the holy place winds up being kept in operation and the ark winds up being kept in operation. But the connection of the two is separated. The ark is now a curious gerund, not for a hundred years, I guess, but probably for about 50 years because then David moves it to Jerusalem. So uh, uh, I had the information on there in the margin of my Bible. It's not like this, but we're not to understand that the Philistines come into the wreck. No, apparently not. But in the, see, in a spiritual sense, it's wrecked in the sense that it's torn apart. And probably that tearing apart or dividing of the two would link up with the curse of the covenant and being separated and, and a lot of other things. Of course, that they, they have really understood that they essentially, without, maybe they didn't shred the, all of the curses, but by taking the ark, they essentially wrecked it. Yeah. They do that. Yeah. Well, all right. We were on number four. The ark is, so to speak, in the wilderness, and we're in the kind of a new wilderness wanderings. Now, number five, the theology of the ark in Samuel. Well, we've talked about this. The theology of the ark in the book of Samuel answers the problem at the end of Judges, that the Israelites are not recognizing Yahweh as king, and as a result, there's moral and political anarchy in the land. The ark complex is the throne of Yahweh. And so what the book of Samuel does is it establishes, tries to establish once again the consciousness of the people that Yahweh is king and that the human king, Saul and David, are vicegerents. Now the book of Kings does the same thing in a somewhat different way. Kings starts with the building of the temple and ends with the destruction of the temple. And the highlighted aspect of the temple, as we'll see tomorrow, are these two new pillars, Yachin and Boaz, which represent king and priest standing shoulder to shoulder guarding the house of the Lord. When the temple is torn down at the end of the book of Kings, that's what's described. That's the main thing that's torn down is this king and priest side-by-side configuration. Well, 
the good kings in Israel are kings who repair the temple. The king is kind of a permanent Bezalel who maintains the temple. He rules the land, but his rulership of the land is properly done when he gives recognition to Yahweh's overlordship and repairs the house of the Lord. So good kings like Josiah and Hezekiah repair the house of the Lord and keep it going. And the Holy Spirit is in them as it is in Solomon to make them builders and maintainers of Yahweh's palace. And the bad kings don't do that. So there's the same kind of theology with different imagery is found in the book of Kings. But in Samuel, it's the recognition of Yahweh through his prophets is the essential thing that must be done if the kingdom is going to be maintained. Otherwise, we'll go back to anarchy. It'll be like the days of the judges. Well, what happens in the middle of the book of Samuel is the enthronement of Ark in Jerusalem, in 2 Samuel 6. And this becomes an important story. It relates to what we just looked at with the Philistines. David acts like a Philistine and blows it here because he puts the Ark on a new cart, just like the Philistines did. Now, were these men so ignorant of the book of Numbers that they didn't know that you were never supposed to put this furniture on a cart, that the priests were to carry it on their shoulders? Either they were amazingly, appallingly ignorant of the books of the law, or else they decided that they didn't have to keep that anymore because it was old and a long time ago. And so what David does is he transports the ark the same way the Philistines did, and he puts it on an ark, and he puts a couple of oxen in front of it to carry it along. I mean, it worked for the Philistines, so why doesn't it work for him? Well, as you know, the oxen stumble. Now, consider this. We have these cows who have calves back home, and when Yahweh is pleased to drive the ark, even though those cows bawl and cry out the whole way, they don't stumble. And they take the ark right where it's supposed to go. Now we have oxen, and we aren't told that they have calves at home or anything, that they have any reason not to march along, and God causes it to stumble. So the miracle here is in the reverse way. And the contrast between the two passages then is very important. God allowed these Philistines to transport it that way because they were not a priestly nation. They weren't under the same rules. But when the Jews imitate the Philistines here, then their oxen stumble and their cart tips over, and the priest Uzzah dies, and David becomes very afraid. Now God reinforces to David just who the king is. David thought he would honor God, but he wanted to honor God his way. This is the regular principle here, you know. He was going to honor God the way he thought God ought to be honored instead of the way the Bible said to honor God. I guess you could really preach the regular principle right out of this because that's what's going on and God is enforcing to David's mind the mind of the people know <laughs> I'm the king and you're supposed to honor me my way carry the ark enthroned on the shoulders of the priests and so he does the ark goes into the house of Obed-Edom and it stays there for a while for three months now verse 12 of Second Samuel 6 now it was told King David, saying, Yahweh has blessed the house of Obed-Edom, the servant of Edom. That's an interesting name. Or the servant of the red. It's interesting to know what this might mean. Does it have a sacrificial image, or does it mean this man was a converted Edomite, or what? But at any rate, he was getting the blessing. And David wasn't. <laughs> and so David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And so it came to pass that when the bearers of the ark, now they're bearing it the right way, you see. When they'd gone six paces, David sacrificed an ox and a fatling. And David was dancing before Yahweh with all his might, and he was wearing a linen ephod. Now the parallel passage in Chronicles says he was wearing a linen robe and an ephod. This is priestly attire. David is dressed as a priest. And he offers sacrifices. David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and sound of trumpet. Now how can David act as a priest? David isn't a priest. He's not of the house of Aaron. He hasn't been anointed. He doesn't have the sacred garments on. How can he do this? He puts on this. Is it a defilement? Is he sinning again to put on an ephod and a robe? No, he's not because this isn't the tabernacle. The tabernacle is not an operation. We don't have the holy space, sacred space. He's not entering into sacred space. We are in the interim time where it's like the patriarchs, where anybody can offer a sacrifice and you can have lots of altars. 
So David can set up an altar, and David can be a priest. And he can put on an ephod. And he can lead the people in worship and sacrifice. And for all I know, he can take the animal and not only kill it, which every layman can do, even in the tabernacle, but he can cut it up and he can put it on the fire. There's no indication that the fire they were using at this point was fire that God himself had lit. In fact, there's every reason to believe it wasn't. Remember that when the tabernacle was set up, God lit his own fire on the altar, and that was the fire that was burned. Remember, when the temple is built, the same thing happens, which tells you that the fire had gone out. But the obvious place to say the fire went out was when the ark was captured and Eli died. The fire on the central altar probably went out or was being maintained where the tabernacle was. But when you move back down to a lower level of altars, then you can use your own fire. So David may well have lit his own fire, and he might have done all the work. But because it wasn't in a temple, it was okay. Once the temple's put back up, oh, kings can't go in there anymore. King can't approach the altar anymore. You understand? Any questions? Now we have the sin of Michal. Michal's sin is her refusal to recognize the ark. It says in verse 16, It happened as the ark of Yahweh came into the city of David that Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window. Stop right there. What's she doing in the palace looking out of the window? Everybody else is down here dancing along around the ark. And she stayed behind in the palace. Now this is kind of is a word to David that David forgets later on because when the ark is out in the field, David stays back in the palace. And David gets in trouble. These things all link up. And now Michal, the first time this happens, Michal is staying back in the palace and she's looking out the window and she despises David because... She likes David as king, and she doesn't recognize Yahweh as king. She's like her father, which is too bad for her. But there again, the question is, you recognize the ark as king? Is Yahweh king? And Saul started out by recognizing Yahweh as king, but he wound up eating unleavened bread with the witch of Endor and fellowshipping at the table of demons, having a Passover meal with the witch of Endor. And Michal is following in her father's footsteps here, and so she's set aside. She doesn't recognize the kingship of the ark. Nikki? say about Nancy, since the tabernacle is not an operation, is that this would have been an argument then against the youth against dancing in the liturgy because it's not a part of the. Would that be, say, when they have been used historically against as I understand it, Mickey, and I, I need to do research on this, but the, the kinds of processions into the church were regarded as kind of a stately dancing event and that the ministers, you could, somehow you got to get the ministers and deacons into the church and get them back out, and so that would be some type of dance. Or if you have a procession in the high liturgical churches when the Gospels are read, the deacons come in bearing the Gospel book, that would be like this, or the bringing of the bread and wine forward, would be like this and so I think those things would be seen as sort of the worship equivalents but I don't know I'll tell you where you can go with this and where some of the charismatics have gone what we're going to see is once the ark is set up here David sets up this whole ceremony of praise with musical instruments and psalms and this is when the psalms are written but when the temple is built later on that's continued see they continue to sing those psalms they continue to use those instruments and the charismatics would say they continue to dance. <laughs> because all the things that David sets up here before the temple was built move into the temple. But I see this as kind of an exceptional thing, but I haven't studied it out. I guess if we had an ark, we could dance and leap in front of it. <laughs> Doesn't that kind of indicate that, I mean, this was not the first time David danced with these things, probably didn't for their culture. Yeah. You have at the Red Sea, the women dance, and, and yeah, I'm sure they were. Let's get away from this subject here. <laughs> <laughs> Michal absents herself from recognizing Yahweh's kingship and is judged for it. Verse 17, they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. So David's made a tent, a tabernacle for the ark. The tabernacle of David, as it's referred to sometimes. And David offered ascension offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Well, that's what you have. And, of course, the attendant bread or tribute offerings went with those. 
but that's all you have. And David can do that because the tabernacle, the sacred space, is not in operation. Verse 18, when David had finished offering the ascensions and the peace offering, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Well, when the tabernacle and the temple are in operation, it's Aaron who's supposed to do that. But that's not an operation now, and so apparently it's okay for David to do it. I'm sure that once the temple was built back up, Zadok was the one who said the blessing. But it's not up right now, so David can do it. And as we'll see in a minute, David is a new Moses anyway. But the reason he can be a new Moses is because the system is not an operation. Verse 19 is interesting. Further, he distributed to all the people and to all the multitude of Israel, both the men and women, a cake of bread and one of dates and one of raisins to each one. Now, a cake of dates is like when you buy dates and they're all jammed together, you know, and raisins the same thing. And then everybody went home. Well, dates, you see, speak of the city of palm trees. Jericho is the counterfeit city of palm trees. It's destroyed when they come into the land. And Jerusalem and the temple are the true city of palm trees. And when the temple is built on the wall, there are palm trees and cherubim all around. There are palms all over the thing because the temple is the true city of palms. And now with the ark enthroned in the city of Jerusalem, it becomes a city of palm trees. And why raisins? Well, my guess is that there's some sense in which the holy war is completed and the Nazarite can once again drink wine, eat raisins and grapes and whatnot. I don't know what else to link this to, but that's my guess. Yes, sir. Could also maybe you referred earlier that it was the king because of his God who fed the people. Yeah. It would be similar in that sense that now that God is there in the ark, David is feeding the people. Yeah, yeah. That's also, you're right. You know, God is the food God, and so food is distributed when God is in throne. I think that any time a king is enthroned, food is distributed in any culture. But it's always very pregnant in the Bible when that happens because it's a sign of God's enthronement that he distributes food. Uh-huh. I was going to say, what kind of crowds are we talking about here? Is this a, this a lot of food? Yeah, it's a lot of food. So Michael, or she's really making a mistake about being in this big crowd of people. I mean, yeah. Like everybody's out there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, this is obviously is a subtle disposition on her part not to participate. I mean, I can't imagine that this was going on and everybody wasn't there. Somehow she wasn't there. And she doesn't get the food. She misses out on the whole package. Uh-huh. Do you see any parallel with what you're talking about with the temple being uh, going on and, and David when he goes out and gets the showbread? Yeah, except that David also claims to be under the Nazarite vow at that point, or at least in a holy war situation. And I think there's equivalent between the holy war camp and the tabernacle courtyard, so I think it was legitimate for David to be given the showbread. But it might also be that everything is under a lesser degree of holiness. Did you have a comment on that? That's what I was going to say. If the tabernacle system isn't all put together, maybe the showbread is not. Except that Abinadab is neither priest. He says it's not proper to give it out and David says yes but we've kept ourselves from him and, and so you know, we're in the holy war camp situation where even if you lose seed at night you become unclean you know and so I think it's the equivalent between the holy war camp and the tabernacle sanctuary by the temporary priests and so they can be given the show there and I think that's what happens in the gospels when Jesus says they're with me and so I can give him bread this is the holy war camp so they're all, they're all priests yeah. One more thing. Uh, is there an analogy here between the, the uh, in verse 19, when we celebrate the sacrament, we give bread wine to the people, are we declaring the enthronement of the king? And, oh, yeah. And by implication, if you stay away, you're excommunicating yourself like Michael did. Yeah, yeah. I think you could preach on self excommunication out of this passage. You absent yourself from worship. You may wind up being divorced by the king. So that's what David essentially does with it. Michael, she winds up. Yeah, no prosperity. <laughs> Lastly, under this section, the sin of David. David repeats the sin of Michal, or however you pronounce, however you choose to pronounce these Hebrew names. <laughs> because when the ark is in the field in Second Samuel eleven eleven, David stays back at the palace. It's so foolish of them, and you know the passage. It starts off at the time when the kings went forth to war. David stayed home. Well, okay. 
we know something's wrong. And then we find that the ark is in the field and all the men are under a holy war vow. So Uriah's not going to go home to his wife because during the holy war you keep yourselves from women just as at Mount Sinai you kept yourselves from women. And David knows about that because like we just said when David went to get the showbread he called attention to it that they kept themselves from women. So this is all a great shame to David and David is not doing anything but keeping himself from women. The men of Israel are all out there under the holy war vow keeping themselves from women. David is back home committing adultery. The ark is out there. David is not there. He's back in the palace just like Michal was. And so he fails to recognize the kingship of Yahweh and the kingdom is almost destroyed as a result. Happily, he repents. Happily, I caught myself before I said that forbidden word fortunately. Now, Seven, why didn't David build a temple? Well, we're told it's in one passage it's because he had been a man of blood. We're told in another passage the implication is because he numbered the people. But I think there's a more general implication in that I'd like to call attention to in terms of the theology of Samuel. Second Samuel 7 tells us that the temple needs to be built by a son. And David is not going to be the son because he is, so to speak, the father. Second Samuel 7, 12 and 13 God says to David in the passage we know very well, When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your seed after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. Well, raise up there means ascend. David's son, in this case Solomon, will ascend to the throne after David's death, and his kingdom will be established. Of course, that's typological of Jesus coming to the throne later on. But here the immediate fulfillment, the near fulfillment, is going to be with Solomon, the king of peace. Solomon means peace. Shalom, Shalomo is really his name. So the son will establish the kingdom. Verse 13, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So it's the son that needs to build the kingdom. But the problem is, as we read on, that David's son is no good. Amnon rapes Tamar. Absalom kills Amnon. Then Absalom leads his revolt against the kingdom. So David is not a very good father, and we're told that David never corrected his sons and never told them no. He's just like Eli, and his sons are behaving like Eli, and the same thing is going to happen as happened to Eli. See, this is all in one book. This is the book of Samuel. Try to do your theology at least partially internal to the book because his themes are consistent. Eli didn't restrain his sons, and the result was the ark went into captivity and everything was torn down. Well, David has got this ark back enthroned in the city, and now David starts to do the same kind of thing Eli did. And he doesn't restrain his sons, and his sons are going wild and committing all these sins, and it may happen again. This may all fall apart again. What's going to happen? Well, just like God let the world be destroyed in the flood, and the next time it started to go downhill, he intervened. He does the same thing here. God intervenes to kill Absalom and to provide something better in Solomon. But David is not a good enough father. We need a better father than David for the son who's going to build the house. What happens when David goes into exile is that Zadok brings the ark out and says the ark will go too. You see, this is the danger. Everything that David built in the city and building a tent for the ark the ark left the tabernacle in Eli's day and didn't come back. And now David leaves and Zadok comes out in 2 Samuel 15, 24, and he's bringing the ark with him. And this may happen again. Now this tent's going to be torn down. We're going to have to start all over again. This is a tremendous threat to the order of the kingdom. It's all because David has not recognized the kingship of Yahweh sufficiently and he's not a good enough father to have a son to do the job. So just briefly, these verses here, Second Samuel 15, Behold, Zadok came out, and all the Levites with him, carrying the ark of the covenant of God. They set down the ark, and Abiathar came up until all the people had finished passing from the city. And the king, David, says to Zadok, Return the ark of God to the city. Let me go into exile. The ark's already been in exile. Let me be the one to go into exile this time. If I find favor in Yahweh's sight, then he will bring me back again and show me both it and his habitation. The habitation of God is the temple, which David does get to see. He sees it in the vision, and he gets the instructions on how to build it, which he gives to Solomon. But right now, he's going into exile. 
verse 26, But if the Lord should say, I have no delight in you, well then, behold, here I am. Let him do to me as seems good to him. And the king said to Zadok the priest, Aren't you a seer? Don't you know what's going on? Return to the city in peace, your two sons with you, your son Ahimahaz and Jonathan the son of Abiathar. And so they go back, and the kingdom isn't really wrecked. David goes into exile. So what we find is that the son who builds the temple has to be a replacement son who has God as his father. And that's said also back by implication in 2 Samuel 7.14. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. God says, I'll replace you as father, David. You won't be good enough. And I'll be Solomon's father. Now, the failure of David and his son which we're at now in Samuel, leads to a new captivity, exodus, and conquest. So we have another repetition. Just look at the parallels between the original captivity. Jacob is parallel to David. Jacob has bad sons. David has bad sons, particularly Absalom. Reuben takes Jacob's concubines. Absalom takes David's concubines. And full sight of Israel and pavilions on top of the palace. This follows up with Pharaoh seizing the brides. Pharaoh says, kill all the boy babies, leave the girls alive, we'll raise up our seed through them. And Satan attacks the bride in order to raise up seed. Absalom, then we see, following that, seizes the brides. Absalom becomes Pharaoh. The Hebrews are oppressed, David is driven out. And Pharaoh is defeated, parallels the defeat of Absalom. The Exodus and Conquest parallels David's re-entry to the land, and you have this staged re-entry of the land on the part of David. He crosses a river, and he comes, and he meets Shimei again, Mephibosheth again, and he conquers the land. All these people bow down to him. Shimei comes out and says, Oh, I'm sorry, I cursed you on your way out. Please forgive me. And then the horse is Ziba, and then the Mephibosheth says, You know, I was in mourning the whole time you were gone. Everybody submits. You know, there's this conquest motif that happens here. And then as we read in Samuel, the next thing we read about is the pacification of the Philistines, which parallels the pacification of the Canaanites. Remember the conquest under Joshua and then the pacification that we looked at briefly in, in Judges that starts in Judges 1 and it never finishes. We have this conquest that David makes and then this pacification of the Philistines is discussed thereafter in chapter 21. And the goal is Jerusalem. In both cases, we head to Jerusalem. David has conquered it. David has already conquered it once. He goes back to it. And now it's possible for the temple to be built. It seems as if we have to have two exoduses and conquests, one of God and one of God's servant, the king, because we seem to be setting up for a kingdom here because when the temple is built, the palace of the king is built right next to it. And so God seems to say, I went into Philistine territory and I came back and conquered the land in a sense. For his sins, David has to, in a sense, bear his own sins here. But he comes back in and now both of those things have happened. The time is right for the temple to be built. You know, unlike the tabernacle, Yahweh was king alone and there was no other king and there was no palace next to it and the judges did not put their tents up next to the tent of Yahweh. But the temple is different. We've moved forward in history. Now we have a king. And the king's palace is on the right hand of God's palace, facing the same direction on the right, on the north. And we're looking east, and the palace is then, what is it, north or south? South, I guess. That's on the south. Similarly, David, it seems, has to go through the same kind of steps here and now it's ready for a palace to be built as well as a temple. Now, that leads us up to where we could stop, but I want to drop back a little bit and look at something about the tabernacle of David, which he sets up for the ark and the situation that's going on there. David actually creates kind of a people temple, and this is important because it shows us once again that the temple is a symbol for the people. And in particularly, it becomes a symbol for the people gathered for worship. The tabernacle that David sets up in the city for the ark, called the Tabernacle of David, and we get information about it in First Chronicles 15 and 16, which expands the story of the enthronement of the ark in this tent. Chapter 15 of First Chronicles, David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent. And David said, no one's to carry the ark of God except the Levites. And so he assembles all of Jerusalem. And then we have all these people that he gathered together. 
and he has the Levites consecrate themselves, and the priests consecrate themselves. In verse 16, and the sons of the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles thereon, as Moses had commanded, according to the word of the Lord. So this gives us much more expanded information about how David did it the right way. Then David spoke to the chief of the Levites to appoint their relatives, the singers, with instruments of music, harps, lyres, loud-sounding cymbals, to raise shouts of joy. And so the Levites appointed Heman, the son of Joel, with his relatives, and Asaph, the son of Berechiah, the sons of Merari, and their relatives, and Ethan, the son of Keshiah. And verse 19, the singers, Heman, Asaph, and Ethan were appointed to sound loud cymbals of bronze. And as you probably remember, we have psalms from each of these. Psalm 89 is by Ethan, Psalm 88 is by Heman, and in there, 12 psalms by Asaph. In the Psalter, these guys wrote the Psalter. Verse 22, Kenaniah, chief of the Levites, was in charge of the singing. He gave instruction in singing because he was skillful. So then they bring this ark up, and we're told a whole lot more. Verse 26, they sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams. Verse 27, David was clothed with a robe of fine linen with all the Levites who were carrying the ark. So he's dressed like a Levite, see? And the singers in Kenaniah, the leader of the singing with the singers. David also wore an effort of linen. You get this picture here. The Levites have all got a robe of linen on. So does David. David also has an ephod. So he sets himself up as kind of chief Levite here on this occasion to supervise all of this worship that's taking place. Well, when we get to chapter 16, uh, verse 1, they brought the ark of God and placed it inside the tent that David had pitched. They offered ascensions and peace offerings. David blesses the people. And this time he gives everybody a loaf of bread and a portion of and a raisin cake. Then, he appointed some of the Levites as servants before the ark of Yahweh to celebrate and thank and praise Yahweh, God of Israel. Asaph the chief, and second to him Zechariah, and then Jael, and Shemiramoth, and Jehiel, and Mattathai, and Eliab, and Benaiah, and Obed-Edom, Obed-Edom, and Jael, or Jael, with musical instruments, harps and lyres, also Asaph with loud-sounding cymbals, and Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priest, blew trumpets continually before the Ark of Covenant of God. Then on that day, David first assigned Asaph and his brothers to give thanks to the Lord. And then there's a psalm here, which is selections from Psalm 105, 96, and 106. Now, in the tabernacle, there's none of this. From what we can tell, the tabernacle liturgy was completely silent. There are no words that are supposed to be said during anything. Not to say that they couldn't talk but nothing was prescribed. No musical instruments are mentioned, and since nothing was supposed to be in the tabernacle and the courtyard that wasn't appointed, I think we can be pretty sure there were no musical instruments in there. I don't have any reason to doubt that the Jews used musical instruments in worship in the synagogues, but as far as the tabernacle worship is concerned, there were no instruments. There was no singing. There were no songs. None of that's appointed and the regulation being the way it is, it would seem that it wasn't there. But David sets this whole thing up under divine inspiration. He sets up a whole temple of praise around the ark once it's enthroned in the city. And this moves into the temple itself that Solomon builds. Now let's read a little bit further. I'll make another comment on that. Verse 37. So David left Asaph and his brothers there before the ark of the covenant of Yahweh to minister before the ark continually, as every day's work required. And Obed-Edom with his sixty-eight relatives, Obed-Edom also the son of Jeduthun and Hosha, Hosha as gatekeepers. He left Zadok the priest and his relatives and priests before the tabernacle of the Lord in the high place that was at Gibeon. Now that's the other one. So Zadok the priest, he ministers at the holy place which is at Gibeon. So we have Zion here. That's the ark here, and that is, so to speak, the most holy. It isn't really, because we're not in the temple yet, but it would be the same as it. And then we have Gibeon, and we have the holy place here, and the bronze altar here. And so, these are two different places, but David sets up this psalm and musical instrument worship at both places. Verse 39, let's just get the facts. This is not stuff we usually study, is it? To me, this is all... I mean, I didn't study this in seminary, I assure you. Verse 39 is relatively obscure, I think. He left Zadok the priest, Zadok or however it is, and his relatives the priests before the tabernacle, 
that is the dwelling place the holy place of Yahweh in the high place that was at Gibeon to offer ascensions to Yahweh on the altar of burnt offering the altar of ascensions continually morning and evening even according to all that's written in the law of Yahweh which he commanded Israel so that part of the Levitical law which applied to ascensions and peace offerings they could do but of course they couldn't do the others because the system wasn't in operation Verse 41 says, With them were He-Man and Jedithan and the rest who were chosen, designated by name, to give thanks to Yahweh because His loving kindness is everlasting. That's virtually a quote. They offered praise and then the words that they offered, this formula phrase is stuck in here to show you what's meant. His loving kindness is everlasting or His mercy endureth forever. Verse 42, And with them were He-Man and Jedithan with trumpets and cymbals for those who should sound aloud with instruments for the songs of God and the sons of Jedithan for the gate. So this shroud of praise is set up around both of these. Now this is nowhere as clear. But let me ask you something. We have Mount Sinai becomes the tabernacle and the people gathered around the mountain become the tabernacle. Now, I want to suggest that these psalms and musical instruments are what become the temple. The temple is kind of an architectural representation of all of this songs, the words of the psalms and the musical instruments that are set up here, in a sense. That's what's kind of added to it. Because these architectural monuments are always symbols of people and what people do. And at this stage, just as Israel gathers around the mountain, and then they're represented by the tabernacle, so what we have gathered around the ark at this point is the psalter and the musical instruments and the singing and the praise. And that, I think, is architecturally represented in the temple. Now, I haven't made a full study of this, and I'm not sure I can get real specific, but that is the direction in which I think the text leads us. That in a large way, the temple is a physical picture of this praise. Now, that's where it becomes practical, you see. We don't have a tabernacle anymore, but we still gather around God's throne. We don't have a temple anymore, but we still sing psalms and use musical instruments, I think. So that the architectural symbol of these things is gone, but the original thing that was set up remains. What you're saying is in the past, everything that we had in the and now we have an auditory cloud, an audible cloud. Well, you see, the first thing that happens in the tabernacle is audible, too, because they're given directions, a whole bunch of words on how to build it, and then they build it. And so now you have something similar, but it's more glorious. You have the Psalter composed, which we're going to get to in a second, and then it becomes visible in the temple. The law of God is put inside the tabernacle. The law tells how the tabernacle is to be built, and then it's put in the tabernacle. It seems to me the Psalter then is composed by David, gathered by David, and it's put inside the temple. And I would think, my guess is, that the putting of the singing of the Psalms in the temple is the same as putting the law inside the tabernacle. It's, you're taking the Word of God and then shrining it in this temple. Is that how you see this uh, progressive unfolding of what's already in the cloud? You know that the great goes off the glory cloud. Yeah. That's not all revealed in the tabernacle. It's slowly unfolded and revealed by the foundation of the glory cloud. Yeah, that's kind of progressive. Yeah. Glory, glory. I don't know exactly what it means either. But I think there's some relationship between what David sets up for the people here and then what the temple represents when it's built later. Because I think that's what happens with the tabernacle. You have the gathering and ordering of people and then you have the symbol represents them. Let me go into the Psalms a little bit. And maybe this assertion will take on a little bit more form. We don't really have time to run through all of these. But the Psalms talk about God being enthroned upon or in the midst of the praises of Israel. Psalm 22, verse 3, 
Yet thou art holy, O thou who art enthroned upon the praises of Israel, or, it can be translated, thou who dost inhabit the praises of Israel. Now, either way, what we're being told here is that the praise forms an environment around God or a throne for God. God is enthroned on the praises or he is enthroned in the midst of the praises. And so the praises of Israel become a kind of temple for God. Similarly, Psalm 100, verse 4, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Well, what gates and courts are these? We don't know who wrote this psalm, so maybe it was, but it's possible the temple had not been built when this was written, as we'll see in a few minutes. There's all kinds of stuff that when you read it, you think it's talking about the temple, but it can't be. And it seems to be more general. Entering his gates and entering his courts would be kind of like we think of it, coming into God's presence, not literally coming into the temple, which may not have been built when this psalm was written, and I guess it probably wasn't. Now, if we look in the Psalter, and I've got a bunch of verses here and we won't read them all, but the temple and sanctuary in the Psalter sometimes refers to this people house of praise. Sometimes it refers to one of the two tabernacles of David. In other words, either the holy place where this worship took place or to the ark in the tent in Zion. And sometimes it refers to heaven. But the reason we have to say it doesn't refer to the temple of Solomon is that the Psalms of David and Asaph and the sons of Korah and some of these others were written before the temple was built. And so it can't have that as its situation. It has to be more figurative language, which, of course, makes the Psalter much easier for us to assimilate into the worship of the church. But it means that they were thinking about it the same way we would. They weren't thinking about Solomon's temple. It hadn't been built yet. They were thinking of the conceptual idea of coming into God's presence. Psalm 5, verse 7, David says, As for me, by thine abundant loving kindness, I will enter thy house. At thy holy temple I will bow in reverence for thee. What house? What temple? David says this. There isn't any house or temple. The closest thing there is is this tent for the ark which David didn't go into. He would have worshipped in front of it. It would seem that entering the temple or entering the house here means gathering with the throng of people in the worship of God. So it's the people house that's pointed to here. Because of the time consideration, I'm not going to look at the rest of these. I hope that you can see the point. And some of these verses will refer to the universal temple and some of them will seem to refer to the people house. The point is David wrote these and there wasn't any temple. When he starts talking about going into the sanctuary and going into the temple, you can't mean that in the sense that Solomon might have meant it. Similar to these Psalms of Asaph. Asaph in Psalm 50. The things Asaph talks about, you wonder what happened. Psalm 50 verse 13. God says, Shall I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of male goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. In verse 23, Asaph says, He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. In other words, there's something of a contrast here, not an opposition, but a contrast between the sacrificial worship of the tabernacle, which still went on to some extent, as opposed to a sacrifice of thanksgiving, which refers to this praise musical instrument psalm system that David has set up. David invents these musical instruments, or develops them, and David puts together the Psalter. And that becomes a context of worship and a house of praise. Psalm 79 verse 1 is kind of interesting, because I think that we can almost guess as to when David wrote this. O oh God, the nations have invaded thine inheritance and have defiled thy holy temple. They laid Jerusalem in ruins. What temple? When was Jerusalem laid in ruins during David's day? Well, it wasn't literally. I mean, Absalom didn't tear the city down. But it would seem that, I mean, this fits real nicely as a poetic expression of Absalom's taking over the city. Well, the Psalter in general, I think, fits with this Tabernacle of David situation before the temple is made very quickly. First Chronicles, uh, the genealogies here, tell us about these guys that wrote the Psalms and when they lived. And First Chronicles chapter 6, 22 says the sons of Kohath were 
Izhar, his son, and Korah, his son. And then in 31, we have the descendants of Korah, and we're told about the Korahites. These are those whom David appointed over the service of song in the house of the Lord after the ark rested there. Well, it's not the temple of Solomon that's being spoken of there, because David wasn't there. They were already appointed over something beforehand. They ministered with song before the tabernacle of the tent of meeting until Solomon had built the house of Yahweh in Jerusalem, and they served in their office according to their order. These are the sons of Korah. Now, if you look in the Psalter, there are 12 or 15 psalms by the sons of Korah. These would have all been written in David's day. And those psalms talk about worshiping in the temple and worshiping in the sanctuary. It has to be relatively figurative language, doesn't it? Because they weren't in a temple. So the temple and sanctuary are the people. You see, that's not just a New Testament idea. It's there at Sinai, and it's here again as David sets things up for the temple to be built. Verse 39 says, His brother Asaph, who stood at his right hand, he's mentioned. Verse 44 mentions Ethan, the son of Kishi, who wrote Psalm 89. The others are mentioned here. This whole section is the people who are producing the Psalms that are in the Psalter. Now, I think some of the Psalms, like By the Rivers of Babylon, came in later on. But the core of the Psalter was put together by David and seems to form this literary house of praise. And God is surrounded by that praise and is enthroned on that praise. And that is, so to speak, the true form of the temple. And Solomon builds a temple that in some way, to some extent at least, reflects that. This is, as Jeff was saying, this is something that is added and glorifies the tabernacle. The tabernacle is glorious, but now we have a movement of glory further. Acts 15.16 talks about restoring the tabernacle of David. And since New Testament worship is said to be a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and not building a tabernacle or a temple, it would seem that it, it makes sense that the reference then is to the tabernacle of David because that's what the tabernacle of David was. It was a tabernacle composed of words and singing rather than stones and wood. And that's what New Testament worship is. It's a tabernacle composed of words and song rather than of stones and wood and cloth. So the, the reference in Acts 15:16, I think, fits nicely with what David does. And then you could, if we wanted to, I mean, if we had the time, maybe there's a Melchizedekal image here that David is king, and at this point he's king as well as priest because he is over the priesthood. He's setting all this up, and it would point forward to Christ, but I don't want to get into the typology of it because I'm not sure where to sort it out. The last thing just to notice in conclusion today, and I'm sorry this is so long, is that David is pictured here as the new Moses. And the Hebrews come out of Egypt. Moses leads them in worship. Moses offers a sacrifice. Moses sets up the priesthood, and then Moses retires, and Aaron does it. Moses never goes into the tabernacle after it's set up. Aaron does it. Well, that's what David does. David leads him in worship. David offers the sacrifices. David establishes a priesthood. He tells Asaph, you do this. And he tells Ethan, you do this. And he tells Zadok, you do this. I mean, David, is he's Moses. He's telling all these priests what to do. He's setting them up. Then, once this gets into operation, David steps aside, just as Moses stepped aside once Aaron was set up in operation, just as Zechariah steps aside once Joshua the high priest is cleansed and gets set up in operation in the restoration. Moreover, as a new Moses, David receives the pattern for the temple. This is set out in First Chronicles 28, 11 and 19, which I will just start with tomorrow. But David says, God showed me all these things, and I described them to Solomon. So just as Moses got the information, so David got the information. He's a new Moses. And thus we have these parallels that we'll look at a little bit more tomorrow. David is to Moses, and Solomon is to Bezalel. Bezalel's in charge of building the tabernacle, and Solomon's in charge of building the temple. And the kings of Israel then, who succeed Solomon, and the kings of Judah are in charge of keeping the thing up. Aholiab is Bezalel's assistant, and similarly in the temple is built, there's a man named Hiram, Hiram the builder, who is Solomon's assistant, who makes things. So the pattern is set up. But what I wanted to get to, I think we did, is that the Psalter figures in very heavily here as a form of the temple. It's a literary form of a temple around God. And I think that 
we're all believing psalm singing here, preponderant psalmody anyway. And I think this points up again why the church has always maintained that. Especially once you understand that when the Psalter refers to coming into the temple and sanctuary, it means it in the same sense we mean it. Because they weren't going into Solomon's temple and they weren't going into Moses' tabernacle. What that means is they were getting together. And when we talk about coming into his case with thanksgiving and entering his courts with praise, that means we're gathering for worship. And that's all it really could have meant to David too because they didn't have a building to go into. So the Psalter has a much more direct connection to our kind of worship than many people realize. The church has always understood that. That's why in the monasteries you went through all 150 psalms every week in the liturgies of the hours. The church has always had the Psalter central and basically regarded it as forming a tabernacle of praise. And I hope that today's study has helped you see that because I think this tabernacle of David stands in between the tabernacle of Moses and the temple of Solomon and tomorrow we can then move into the temple of Solomon and appreciate it a little bit better.